Hello, in this video, I'm gonna be showing you how to win Civ 6 on Deity at a bird's eye level. This is gonna be a presentation, it's not an actual game. I'm gonna be going over some beginner strategy and what you can do to maximize your chances of eking out your first Deity win. So this is aimed at players who have played the game several times on Prince, King, Emperor. They're really familiar with at least one particular win con and they know the ins and outs of the game. They know what they're doing. They maybe have tried their hand a little bit at Deity play, uh, and they just aren't aren't quite getting to that that level eight play yet. So that's what I'm going to be covering in this video. And before we jump in, I just want to remind you to give the video a like if this is something that interests you and that you want to see more of in the future. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel. The first and most important thing to remember is that in this process, you're going to lose. You're going to lose a lot. If you're not here for the challenge, then I would just recommend continuing to play at a lower level of difficulty. Deity is a level where even the best player will not win every single game. It's supposed to be a challenge. So what I would have you do as a very beginner player who's never won on Deity before, I would have you begin every game with the expectation that you'll lose. Now, that doesn't mean don't play to win. Play to win. Play your absolute best. Do what you think is right in every situation. But just set a low bar for yourself so that you don't get frustrated and disappointed. The other thing that you can do is let yourself get into bad situations and then try to recover from them. Don't just quit at the first sign of trouble because if you do that, you're not actually going to learn lessons. You're not actually going to figure out what you can do to make the best of a bad situation. And there are many, many times where you can pull out a victory from the jaws of defeat in Deity if you know what you're doing, but you have to learn how to do that. And uh, another thing I would encourage you to do here uh, in service of that goal is to save scum. There's a feature you can use in the game where you can uh, have it remember more than 10 autosaves. By default, the game uh, remembers your last 10 turns of, of autosaves, but you can set the game to remember all autosaves. I highly, highly encourage you to do that because you never know which exact turn that you want to go back to. If you want to go back 30 turns in time, 50 turns in time, if you realize that you've made a strategic blunder all the way back 30 turns ago, like, oops, I forgot to get that battering ram, and now that my troops are at the city, I'm not able to knock down the walls, that's a chance for you to go back and learn from that mistake by actually building a battering ram. So while you're just learning how to play Deity, save scum all the time, do it. That's how I learned how to play on Deity, is to be able to just, oops, rewind mistakes about, you know, 10 turns without having to start the game over all over again. Something to keep in mind in, uh, in general for Civ is that the first 100 turns of the game are the most important turns. Uh, so how do you actually make that apply to your deity play? What you do is you just practice the first 100 turns of a game over and over, right? And, and turns uh, the beginning of the game to like turn 25, strategize. Get a scout out there, start looking at the map, seeing what you see. Do you see steady states? Do you see a close neighbor that you could uh, take over? Do you see good settles? Do you find a wonder? Look at your area, strategize, figure out what it is that you want to do, and then those next 75 turns, execute. And the goal here is to have about seven cities by turn 100. Now that's like a lower limit. If you have more than seven cities by turn 100, you're doing great. If you have a, a bit fewer, then you have a little bit of catching up to do. Obviously the quality of these cities also matters, but that's just a general benchmark that I have for myself. And not every victory type has that benchmark. For instance, for instance, the religious victory type, uh, probably fewer cities than that about turn 100. But anyway, uh, I digress. The other thing you can do is record yourself while you're doing this. So like I mentioned with the save scums, uh, keep every auto save so that you can go back in time, but also watch yourself, like get OBS, start recording yourself into the microphone, talk to yourself. This is going to be a dialogue. It's a learning experience. So you need to start communicating with yourself. And then later on, your future self can go back and look at all of these mistakes that you've made, see what you could do to shore up, see what things you overlooked in your own game. And then of course, go back to those auto saves and uh, fix the mistakes. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's actually start talking about, uh, in terms of strategic importance, what are the things that you really need to care about on Deity? So in these 100 turns, the things you're looking for, uh, first of all, you've got war. Whether or not you can avoid a war with your neighbors, that is the most important, most crucial factor to whether you will win the game or not. You have to understand, 
Even though the AI gets a bunch of bonuses on Deity, it's still an AI and it's still not a very smart AI. It's going to squander those bonuses. So if the game goes to its own devices, you will win the game. All right, full stop. Like if, if you're winning the game really handily on Settler, or sorry, on a Prince or King, and you just economize, you're going to win the game on your own. What will stop you, what will cause you to lose is if the AI looks at you and says, huh, that's some nice land, I'd like to take it. So if you can avoid war throughout a whole game, you'll win. And early wars are the most important. Next most important thing is whether you have a natural wonder in your uh, starting area or whether you can quickly settle a natural wonder because those tiles are going to be amazing. You're going to be able to get an early advantage and then compound on that advantage for the whole rest of the game. So I would highly encourage you, if you find a natural wonder, go settle that thing unless it's like the Dead Sea or you know the bad wonders by now. <laughs> The next thing is the number of cities that you look at and that you can settle. And uh, quality of cities matters, right? So if you can settle more than seven cities, you're in good shape. Uh, next is tile quality and also district quality for each of those cities. If your first, second, and third cities have really, really good tiles, like super good profitable tiles, a tile needs two food on it to break even. If the tile has less than one food, then you'll be growing uh, at a, a reduced rate for that tile. But anything beyond two food on a tile is all profit. So the more that that tile has, the stronger that tile is in terms of quality. If you have a lot of quality tiles in your first, second, and third cities, you're going to uh, find it easier to get your next cities. You're going to find it easier to get all of your districts down. And similarly, in terms of districts, like if you're going to play a science game and you have seven cities, but none of them have plus three campuses, it's going to be a really hard time. So make sure that the cities that you settle, you have yourself uh, some really good district placement. That's really, really crucial for whether or not you will win long-term, whether you can gain an advantage of the AI and then compound that advantage over time. And lastly, whether you have built one of the really important early game wonders. If you can wind up building the pyramids or the oracle, which I think are probably the two most important early game wonders, another couple are like Petra and the mausoleum, if you can build one of those really important early game wonders and then compound on that advantage over time, it's just like, it's like finding a natural wonder. If you find a natural wonder, you settle it, you get an advantage for the rest of the game. It's just, you get the chance to choose that natural wonder. If you choose to build the pyramids, then yes, you're going to have awesome builders for the rest of the game. And you're going to start building builders as soon as feudalism kicks in and you'll have six charge builders. It'll be fantastic. So I mentioned that the most important of all of those factors is whether or not you can avoid war. So let me tell you about how to actually do that. It comes down to maintaining a positive relationship with the AI. And the best way to do that is to just bribe them. Okay. If you want to make sure that you have a peaceful game throughout the rest of the game, you can declare an early friendship with your neighbors and then ultimately an alliance with them. And you'll be able to carry that forward for the rest of the game but it starts very early. So the first thing you do as soon as you meet that player, you send them a delegation for 25 gold. If they don't get the delegation the first turn you know that they exist, they will not accept it any turn later. They'll be unfriendly with you and things will go downhill. Ultimately, you'll get denounced, you'll go to war, you'll lose. So send a delegation. It's the most important thing you can do in the very early game, okay? The next thing you can do, as soon as you can, just give them 100 gold, okay? You're going to have the spare gold. Don't buy the extra tiles in your capital or anything like that. Just don't get too too greedy because you're going to want to spend that in securing peace. If you just literally bribe them, get in their good graces, you can get a positive relationship with them for the whole rest of the game for 100 gold. It is absolutely, totally worth it to save that gold for that purpose. Especially when you factor in the fact that if you have a delegation, you get better trades with that player. So if you've settled on a luxury, trade that luxury to them. If you have any source of diplomatic favor, just sell them your extra diplo favor. If you've got horses, iron, whatever, you can sell those goods to the AI while they're not doing you any good in the very beginning of the game. And then you have more gold to go to your other neighbor and, and buy peace from them. Another thing you can do while you're trying to improve that relationship is send a trader to them. I'm talking about the trader that you unlock with foreign trade, the actual unit. You can send a road to them, get a trading post. You can get more gold over time. You, it, traders are just very, very good units. And one of the really good things about them is that they keep the AI happy with you, especially if you're next to Wilhelmina. She freaking loves it, right? Okay. And lastly, 
once you've become friends with them, then that's when you can build settlers and forward settle them. And they might come and ask you not to, and they'll be a little bit peeved for a little while, but they will be friends with you for 30 turns, so they'll literally be unable to attack you, and by 30 turns, they'll pretty much just forget that you've done it, because grievances very early in the game, they diminish so quickly. I think it's like a minus seven a turn or something like that. If you generate 25 grievances for every city that you settle, that's like four turns of them being upset. So, I mean, you definitely want to maintain the relationship over time, continue giving them favorable trade deals, etc. Like, play conservatively here. Try to avoid a war. So... You can avoid a war or you can win it, right? So there's an entirely uh, different uh, aspect of this, which is if you decide to take over your enemy, you can go for craftsmanship as quickly as you can, right? You uh, go for the upper half of the civic tree, the lower half of the tech tree. You can uh, build warriors as quickly as you can and archers. Once you've got the agoge card, and you get the production discount. Like even two warriors is enough to take over a city as long as their military is at the position, right? If there's a city that's got one or two uh, citizens in it and get two warriors there, put it under siege, surround it, couple bops, it's gone, right? And now it's yours. So you can get some really good positive um, gains very early. You can also go for a quick oligarchy. You could go for quick swordsman with oligarchy. That can be really strong um, depending on how long you want to wait. And often, just taking one or two cities from this player is enough to really curtail their ability to, propose, to pose a real threat to you for the rest of the game. Especially if you go to an early war, you take a couple cities, you get out while the getting's good, and then you gear up for another stronger war where you push and take even more cities of them. Uh, if you do that, I would kind of encourage you to just go ahead and eliminate that player because eventually they will... Uh, come and try to declare war on you and take over the rest of their cities again. Like just generally speaking, that's what I've noticed as their pattern. So if you're going to really uh, go ham on that player, I would recommend just eliminating them. If you only take a, uh, take a couple cities from them, you can usually start uh, going back to the avoid war tab here, like pay them gold, uh, trade with them, try to bribe them and get in their good graces, satisfy their agendas and get back on their good side. And of course, you can also do this to city states. Uh, on deity, city states have walls, so you will need to wait for battering rams. That's a good reason to get masonry kind of early. Uh, I really don't think there's many reasons to get masonry, but I guess this is one of them. If you had a bunch of city states around you and you know they have bad bonuses, I generally try to keep city states around because if they have really good bonuses, like if they're a, a scientific city state, that can really benefit my science game much more than having just one more city in my empire, especially if they're the uh, scissor and bonus is really good. But if you want to take over a city state, like be my guest, just make sure you have a battering ram. All right, so uh, now I'm going to get back into more of the, like what can you do to maximize your chances in terms of like subtle cheeses on the game? So the first thing to do is to try for a science victory, or if you are more comfortable with another victory type, then just try the victory that you're best at, the one that you keep playing over and over. If you don't have one of those, I would recommend trying science. It's the most straightforward. It's the one that it's most obvious to tell whether you're winning or losing. It's just it's just the easiest one. It's the most comfortable one. The next thing that I would recommend is that you pick an S tier sieve. Pick a sieve that's going to give you strong advantages that you know is going to win you the game. Uh, like that's what I did. You know, I played a few games with Korea. They didn't go so well, and then. At some point, I switched to Frederick. I played a couple games with him. They didn't go so well. But then uh, one of them with Frederick wound up taking me all the, all the way, and I narrowly eked out my first DD win, right? And then, of course, I immediately played Korea and repeated it, right? Like, it, pick strong sieves. It's easy. The game is easier when you pick strong sieves. Like, you're learning how to play this, right? You don't have to jump into the deep end in terms of difficulty. Once you're ahead in the game, play conservatively. Like, especially, especially if you're ahead, you need to consistently play like a little bit paranoid. Continue asking yourself, what is it that could cause me to lose? Hint, hint, it's war, right? But just just make sure that you're constantly checking and saying, okay, who's who's uh, got uh, close to a culture victory? Can I buy great works from them to slow them down, et cetera, et cetera. Another thing you can do is to play with secret societies on uh, Secret Societies makes the game a little bit easier because you get more governor titles and you get them quicker in the game so you can get a quick Pingala and Pingala can give you early culture which can get you to your early political philosophy and getting your political philosophy earlier allows you to run more policy cards and better policy cards. So uh, see, playing with Secret Societies on 
inherently gives you more governor titles earlier in the game so you can do more things. And that's not even talking about the advantages you can get from secret societies. And I guarantee you, if you play with secret societies, you'll get more advantages from your secret society than the AI will. I mean, you're a human like that. The AI doesn't know what to do with those bonuses, but you will. And another thing you can do is max out the number of city-states. There's a couple things that does for you. First of all, that increases your chances of getting a really good city-state that you know to become citizen of. And the AI doesn't know, like Hong Kong, for example. Hong Kong is a great city-state to have if you're going for a science victory. But the AI doesn't know that. They treat all city-states equally. So you can eke out a quick suzerainty of, of Hong Kong at the very end of the game and get bonus production towards your uh, space projects. But another reason to do that is it gives you, if you're going on the domination path, it gives you more free cities to conquer. If you're going for a more peaceful one, it gives the AI more targets that aren't you. And if you're going domination, you can also max the number of players in the game. That does, that's a little paradoxical, right? Because you have more capitals to conquer. So you're thinking, what advantage does that provide? Well, it gives you closer neighbors that you can conquer sooner and get a stronger empire than everybody else's sooner. So that's something you could do, especially if you have a sieve that's really strong in the early, early game, like Rome or the Aztecs or uh, Alexander. And lastly, you could choose Archipelago if you want a super safe game and you're pretty good at harbor economies like the one that I did with uh, John Curtin. I just went to a lot of wars that day and I was like, you know what? I'm done with this. I don't want to try and uh, appease a neighbor. I'm going to pick an archipelago because I know I'm not going to be attacked by any land neighbors. And then, of course, I can just get a harbor economy and wind up winning. So a uh, sieve like Indonesia would be a really good one for an archipelago map. All right, so I've mentioned picking an S-tier sieve. What do I consider S-tier sieves? Well, the first one is Korea. Korea gives you plus four adjacency bonus on your campuses as long as you're, uh, you're tactful with them. And uh, having plus three or better on your campuses is really important because rationalism gives you a huge boost to science if you have plus three or better. And so you just automatically have all of your campuses be eligible for that. That's amazing. And then, of course, it gives you bonus science and bonus culture for having governors. It's just a really strong sieve. Another one is Frederick. Frederick's really good for a science win because he gives you a whole lot of production. Uh, basically, every city in your empire can have really strong production and really strong um, can have a, a trade route because he gets discounts for uh, Hansa's his unique industrial zone and those get adjacency bonuses for having commercial hubs so you can have a really really strong empire with lots and lots of production be really flexible if someone declares war on you you can quickly just churn out a military and go back to defending yourself it's a really strong civ really solid in terms of culture, we've got Pericles. Pericles is a really good all-rounder kind of sieve, but getting that plus 5% bonus to culture for each city-state that you're suzerain of is really, really strong. Uh, half price theater squares means you get your theater squares down quicker, you get more great person points. So if you just pick up an oracle and put Pingala in the oracle city and then just have a bunch of Acropolises all around and then become friends with a lot of other city-states, you're essentially just going to, going to snowball into a win. Okay, Peter's another one. Peter gets extra great person points for culture from his uh, holy sites. Like if you play with Peter, you basically are going to be lousy with ways to win the game. You can win the game on a religion game. You can win on culture. He's just really, really strong overall. And then uh, Cyrus, uh, Persia's possibly the best civ in the whole game. Uh, you've got a really, really strong, unique swordsman. So if you have iron in, in your empire, you can conquer your neighbor and then quickly turn around and go for an extremely good culture win because of his unique tile improvement. And lastly, there's Simone Bolivar, who gets a bonus movement for all of his military units. He gets free great generals. He's uh, really, really strong because you don't have to actually uh, wait a whole turn before you can use your catapults. You can move your catapults, and then they'll still have enough movement to take shots. So that's really, really powerful. And especially having all of that under the guise of free great generals, it's, this is just a, a not so sieve. Like, it's almost like not even playing on deity. And that's all I had today in the way of practical deity advice for how to get your first win. Thank you so much for watching my video all the way through. Please don't forget to give it a like and subscribe to my channel if you're not already subscribed. The algorithm makes me beg, but I know it's annoying, but please do. Uh, one last thing before I go. If you happen to be one of the first couple hundred people who watch this video, uh, 
or you're one of my first 30 subscribers, I just want to say thank you very much for uh, helping me out getting off the ground floor with this channel uh, as a thank you. And uh, it also benefits me too. I'm thinking that uh, I might actually want to review some uh, some DD Let's Plays. So uh, I don't know how long I'll be offering this, but uh, I, I want to give this at least a try. If you're interested in getting your DD game reviewed, uh, you can just um, start up a new DD game. Go for about the first 100 turns or so. Save every 10 turns. And then once you get to the end of that, uh, go ahead and give me a link to all of the saves in the comments and I'll take a look at where you are in terms of snapshots and if I select your um, series then I might actually upload a video analyzing the decisions that you made. I may, I may even uh, jump into the game at, at a particular point and show you what you might be doing wrong or, or what you could be doing better. If that's something that interests you please go ahead and do that and um, who knows maybe I'll pick your video and I guess that's all I had today. Thank you very much again. Don't forget to like and subscribe and I will see you in the next one.